All right. Get started. So how many people traveled to Boston for this event? Raise your hand. Wow. There's like nobody from Boston in this room. <laughs> so you all are going to go to a Fenway game on Wednesday. And I kid you not, you're going to sing Neil Diamond's Sweet Caroline. <laughs> and I want to prepare you for this. It's going to go a little bit something like this. You'll hear Sweet Caroline. Now, this gets better the more beer you drink. So drink beer. You will raise your hand and go, ba, ba, ba. Good times never seem so good. And I kid you not, you will chant, so good, so good, so good. It's, it's unbelievable. So welcome to Boston. <laughs> My name is Mike Barrett. I'm one of the product managers here on the OpenShift team. I have with me. Go ahead, and me. Yes. Oh, I'm uh, Clayton Coleman, uh, architect for OpenShift and Kubernetes at Red Hat. Mark Curry, I'm a product manager for OpenShift, cluster infrastructure. Mark is actually Clayton's lawyer. That's why yes. he's dressed up. <laughs> I always bring a lawyer to me when I talk to people who might use our product, just, just in case violence happens. I just came from my lobotomy. Yeah. So I got to... So we get to talk about Kubernetes. And I, I would say starting this year is the first time I do, I never have to explain what Kubernetes is. We've, we've Kuber, what? We've, we've gotten past that in the industry. This is a great project to be a part of. And we're happy to be a part of it too. And this is from Slack Analytics. I love going to this tool and playing with the time dates, right? So this is commits since project inception. And you can tell the, the beauty of an open source project when the independent contributions become so large. That's when it really sort of catapults itself into its next tier of innovation. And that's definitely what we're seeing right now. Now, the Red Hat engineering team, if you're a Red Hat engineer working on Kubernetes, stand up. These, these uh, men and women are almost pulling double duty. There's, not, there's only 24 hours in a day, and we actually ask them to work 24 hours. Um, they have to be part of the SIGs, right? They have to call in and, and be part of the community and lead that project, that section of the project, while also dealing with us product management teams and asking them to do their, their other jobs during the day. So it, it's quite an impressive feat to be leading this many SIG groups. And you see us really specializing in areas where our customers really wanted innovation quickly because they wanted to bring it to production faster than what was there in, in the community. So we're in the community on your behalf, driving these features and getting them accepted. Now, if you're not familiar with it, you can go to ci.openshift.redhat.com slash release underscore roadmap or something like that. And you can see very, very nicely where we're working on what. I did that last night and this pattern emerged. If I look at where most of our hours and sprint cycles are being spent, in the Kubernetes project, it's around persistence, it's around security, it's around workload diversity, and cluster reliability and resilience. So we're gonna go into each one of those topics, and this is an ask me anything session, so please stop us at any given time and, and raise your hand, and, and anything you see on the slide that's confusing, let us know. So Clayton, do you wanna talk a little bit about cluster reliability and sure. resilience? Sure, so I, I think this is something that we think of as the, the actual hard part, right? Building features, you know, everybody gets excited about adding a new feature to the product. But at the end of the day, it's really about if you start something running, does it keep running? Do you not have to worry about it? So you can go worry about other stuff. And so um, there's a lot of very technical, and I almost want to say like these are too technical at some level, right? This is a bunch of scheduling and workload nerds who sit around in rooms and talk about you know, queuing theory and resource management and hierarchies of control. But all of the things that Red Hat's involved in are just about taking actual concrete problems people are facing and focusing on making those as reliable as possible in Kubernetes. So um, I think an interesting one that I like to call out here, uh, the first two um, are really about making Kubernetes easy to extend. This is critical, right? Like, Kubernetes is not supposed to be this static project that you just use and it solves all your problems. It's supposed to be something that the community can build solutions around, that people can solve problems in new novel ways that make applications easier to run, that make it easier to secure your cluster, that make it easier to integrate third-party cloud provider services. Um, service Catalog, which you saw in the earlier AMA, is taking advantage of the aggregated API service work just to make it easier to plug in um, and that plug-and-play aspect is going to be a really fundamental part of Kubernetes going forward. Uh, 
auto scaling, auto idling, auto sizing. This one comes up a lot. You know, you have these big clusters. You know, so people, everybody starts small. You run a couple things. You add a few more, and suddenly you have all these containers running. Our focus with auto scaling, auto idling, and auto sizing is really about helping you understand what's actually happening, and then at the platform level, automatically going and scaling down things that aren't doing anything. So if you've got a, a, a test app that is being used an hour a week, there's no reason it needs to be running. And trying to build these into the platform to make it easier for your applications to automatically react, not just to your needs as a developer or as an operator, but also to the needs of kind of the, the business, scaling it down to make room for other people. So how many people have written an emission controller or a controller in Kubernetes or extended Kubernetes itself yet? What are some of the things that, that you've, you've extended? Okay. And, so, and so some of the things that we're running into are um, node resource management, um, being able to have enough resources to s spin up a container to go and do the actual work, um, pod management, um, replica set, and um, lifespan management. So things of those na that nature really fit into there. Okay. Cool. Anybody else? If you go to KubeCon, you get a lot of people that are doing some really amazing things. They, um, if you can think of a reason to create a controller, they've thought of it. There's, there's controllers that, that will provision Kubernetes itself when it needs another cluster. Um, so there's, there's a quite a bit of, of really awesome work going on here. And Red Hat's driving this aggregated API services because you want to hit one central API and you want to then go into all these other sort of APIs. And uh, that's, that's, that's the beauty of that yeah, solution. And, and I think like we started to see, you know, everybody has different ways of solving certain problems, but a lot of times it, it comes down to patterns. You know, you see a pattern as an operator or a developer and you want to harness that pattern. So um, this actually comes up when people talk about, uh, CoreOS had mentioned operators as a concept, which is just a little bit of software that drives, you know, spinning up etcd or spinning up Elasticsearch or, you know, anything that you can pre-can and have it be managed for you. The idea of like an intelligent agent almost. And we see that pattern so much that we want to make it easy for people to, to be able to say, you know, I know how to run Postgres. And because I know how to run Postgres, I may start with, you know, just setting up a template and creating it, but then I would start to want to operate that and manage it. And some folks, um, Crunchy Data, um, one of the OpenShift uh, partners has actually built um, on some of this work and some other work in the community to go build one of these automated systems. And they're, they know how to run Postgres, and they know how to put together these operators to make that happen automatically. We want to make it really easy for everybody else to be able to go do that, to take from the, you don't have to know all the details. And the broker SDK that uh, Paul mentioned, uh, earlier, it's the same kind of pattern. We want to make it easy to solve specific problems and to experiment in companies um, to, to get those use cases in code. Cool. And a, a lot of the auto scaling, auto island, auto sizing work had a lot to do with figuring out how to clean up Heapster and, and have a data repository for these. There's a lot of debate in the community on whether or not the kubelet should be asked to do all these extra monitoring tasks or whether another child process should have been spawned. That has all resolved itself, and it's really opened up the floodgate in the, the uh, 1.7 time frame for us to really, really attack that solution. I know a lot of you in the room have been waiting for custom metrics for auto scaling instead of just CPU. Uh, you've been waiting for network um, connection, connectivity for auto, auto idling. Um, and auto sizing, now that we have all that data, we can make predictions for you, right? If we see that you're launching another workload and you're having a hard time figuring out what quotas you want to put on that pod, we can make some suggestions based on other people that have launched that workload. So that's all work that's now pouring out of the, the fact that we solved that problem. And the next one is disruption budgets. I love this word, disruption budgets. Um, you know, when you're running the cluster, wouldn't it be great if you could bake in some intelligence into the workloads that the workloads wouldn't let the admin hurt them in a bad way? But the admin can still work on a very high level and just say blindly do this, Mr. Cluster. And disruption budgets really allow us to bake that into the workload. So I can, I can say, hey, when you deploy this, this EAP cluster, make sure there's always two instances up and I can bake that in, into that knowledge. So now when the admin tries to drain out the cluster, it says, hey, wait a minute, I need to, I need to make sure I have two. So that's a disruption budget, and you can really see how that's gonna help us balance that cluster out. 
Federation gets a lot of play time. You'll hear more and more people talking about Federation. Uh, how many people have heard about Kubernetes Federation? Yeah, we're, we're following it with great interest. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about it? Yeah, so uh, we think about, you know, Federation is still somewhat of a growing project. And the goal for Federation in Kubernetes is to make, allow you to run a workload across a couple of clusters without having to think too much about it. So you set the policy. And if um, a cluster goes down, the cluster federation can pick those workloads up. And, and federation, in a sense, is just like one of those patterns that I talked about earlier, right? It's a way of saying, instead of just dealing with one cluster, I'm going to deal with multiple clusters. I'm going to do the same operations. I'm going to, um, I'm going to allow it to be balanced. So I might want to put more weight in the European <laughs> region than in the US region. Uh, above and beyond federation, and I think this is where you know, the red hat interest comes in, is it's really not just about federating workloads, because I mean I would guess that everybody would say, well, you know, all workloads are the same. Well, if all workloads are the same, why do we have dev, QA, and production clusters? Why do we have rules about who can access production? So some of what we'd like to do with federation is not just about workloads, but helping people who want to run multiple clusters, who have to run multiple clusters for um, security reasons, for process reasons, for isolation reasons. You know, the goal of running multiple clusters is not trying to make it too hard to run. It's to say, at worst, if you lost this entire cluster, does my business keep operating? And there's a question down here. Yeah, in regards to the federation kind of isolation workload types, are you guys putting any thought into all the data sovereignty laws that are starting to be passed and making sure certain workloads remain in certain clusters only? And I think this is, this is actually a really great topic because a lot of people out of the box, and this happens because the way that a lot of people use Kubernetes is they tend to have one or two applications that are their whole cluster. Um, they think, okay, well, Federation's gonna be this pane of glass on all the clusters, and it can absolutely do that. Um, when you start talking about sovereignty rules or um, po internal policy or different classes of employees being able to access different data, um, one of the approaches that we'd like to actually take is make Federation be more of an on-demand thing that's about helping a specific set of workloads run really well. So the, the problem with a single pane of glass is if you don't design it quite right, if you lose the federation controller, every workload is now broken. And so we think, I think this is gonna evolve, but I think our goal would be you can run many federations and you can keep them scoped if you want to, to specific teams, organizations, applications, workloads different clusters, different regions, and make that easy to do. So we'd like it to be as easy to spin up a new federation as it is to spin up a new app, to give it only the permissions it needs, because the other problem with a single federation layer is if you compromise that federation, does that mean every single cluster has now been compromised? So we don't want to create a new single point of security failure. We want to make it easy for you to say, um, only the production team can access these applications. That means that the production team should be able to access these clusters if they want to do deep debugging. Sometimes they can. And the federation controller should only, each, a particular federation might only be able to do what it's allowed to do in a very specific set of those clusters. So the, the very easy answer is we think federation can be single pane of glass if you want it to be. As you get bigger, we want it to be easy to transition into that next level of separation. So you might have 100 clusters. You might have 10,000 applications. What are the odds that all 10,000 of those applications should all be at one point of failure? And we'd like to make it easy to say, you can reason about that, separate your clusters out, and handle it that way. Is anybody in here uh, moving towards or working with network function virtualization at all? That's about right. That's it. <laughs> so that's something that's coming, but it's not here yet. But that's something that really requires federation. The ability to stand up, say, when Singapore comes <coughs> online, bring up 10,000 VPN firewall connections for those employees at those locations. And then as the clock moves, uh, as the sunlight moves across the world, to stand up and bring down these different uh, locations and auto idle them. But federation is absolutely required to track all of those. And so, but that's, that's a longer term goal of ours. And federation is also longer term. So I think they're going to come together about the same time. And, and I'd, I'd like to make one other point as well. It's like, <clears throat> if you're an organization that's running lots and lots of software, you have processes and tools in place to help manage that today. What we'd like to do is actually, when we think about federation, it's really a company has already solved many of these challenges. You know, we use LDAP centrally 
to manage users and identity. Um, sometimes some people use um, LDAP to manage policy centrally. So they'll create groups and they'll bind groups and they'll put attributes on groups that say what you can do in certain spaces. Some people use third party tools to do that. We'd like to make it easier um, you know, as a whole infrastructure to reason about if I have these set of policies that come from a certain source like LDAP or a central config, uh, configuration management DB, how do I apply those safely to large numbers of clusters? So instead of setting up each individual cluster as a snowflake, make it easier and easier both in OpenShift and in integrations to be able to easily say, I'm running a couple hundred clusters. It's no different than running two clusters. And to make that be as easy for administrators and operators um, to scale as an individual cluster is. Because there'll always be reasons to separate clusters and to separate workloads. Cool. Any, before we move on to the next uh, quadrant, any questions about cluster reliability projects or anything going on in that area? Any concerns? Any, you've been using the product for a while, you really wish it would do something in, in regarding we have a requirement to have a dedicated IP per project namespace. Is there anything in the works that's going to solve that? That's not the egress router, egress firewall? So you want a dedicated IP for outgoing traffic? Um, so we actually, I mean, we have the, um, the external IP uh, allocation work mm -hmm. that could potentially be overlaid, but I, I don't know that there's anything specifically today. We, we have it on a roadmap. We actually have a, car, a card for that. It's, it's a work in progress. Um, and uh, the goal being one IP per project for egress. How that's actually going to map out, uh, we, we've got other things like the ability to have one egress router um, uh, provide egress for more than one uh, pod, more than one project. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're still trying to figure that out, how exactly that's going to work, but that's absolutely on a near-term roadmap to provide that functionality. We have a number of uh, large customers that, that require that. And that will work with mutual auth? With what? Mutual auth certificates. So how are you doing the, how are you doing the uh, DNS assignment for those IPs today? Do you want to do this on an IP basis for mutual auth? I think that um, that's getting into like some of the stuff that we'll talk about in the security side. But this might actually be something that we just want to have a deeper discussion on. Because it always comes down to the cluster makes it easy for you to control network. And we want to add more capabilities to control you know, identity on the network, but then that next step up into controlling signing um, probably be useful to discuss more. We have some work coming along the lines for certificate uh, authentication, but I don't know that it exactly matches the egress use case. Well, the other big area of investment is workload diversity, and we have a, a pretty good flavor of features for cloud native. In the last release, you saw Kubernetes deliver stateful sets. This is really for ordinal services, for applications that have very, very peculiar things that have to take place in a very specific order, and you want to be able to sort of orchestrate that following that order. We now have stateful sets. And you just heard earlier on the stage brokers, right, for off-platform services. The only thing that's there that hasn't really been addressed is low latency services. And uh, now that we, we have full workload diversity, we can start investing in these. Uh, this week, actually, today, it kicked off at Google headquarters. We have uh, IBM Watson, we have NVIDIA, and 24 other members of the resource SIG and Kubernetes at uh, Google headquarters. And we're really pounding out this new design. Uh, it's been championed a lot by Ab IBM Watson and uh, obviously NVIDIA. But there's a lot of debate on whether or not, again, you, you heard me mention this before on the uh, extending the kubelet and how much we should be asking the kubelet to do. Um, there's a concept here where we think we're going to create a child isolator process, and this isolator process will go interrogate the hardware and find out what, what that hardware is capable of and pass that back to the API services into a scheduler. Now, whether that is an extension of the existing scheduler or another scheduler that will tackle these very specific problems, that's up for debate, and that's what the, the great minds are working on. Um, the next one, you want to talk about image? Actually, I was yeah. going to actually ask a question. So how many people here today have workloads that they want to run on OpenShift or Kubernetes that would, they would consider high performance, low latency sorts of applications? OK. And how many of would like those same benefits for their regular applications? OK. So this is actually an interesting one, which is we tend to see that a lot of people are focused on the special cases because they have those special cases and they're doing lift and shift or they're trying to adapt to get the other benefits of containers. But one of the things that's kind of been a struggling block on this 
in the design side is we said, well, we could go exp ex expose every single knob that exists in the kernel for every use case possible. Would the end system actually be more usable? And that's actually been some of the, the process of trying to work together on the app side, maybe the, I've got a web application. If possible, I want it to get an exclusive core automatically. And then say, we also want that to work well with the very custom tuning, so all the custom tuning is possible. And so balancing that has actually been some of the delay, as we'd love for everyone to upgrade once these designs start to play in. And everybody's clusters to instantly go to the point where if you ask for a single core, you actually get an exclusive core. And to have the Cuba do that automatically, but then still preserve all the flexibility of when you want to take control away and fine tune. Because in reality, you know, fine tuning is always going to help you get that last mile of performance. But the broad stuff will benefit every application. How many people are using on the next topic, using the OVS network that comes out of the box? Are you replacing it? People are using the OVS? Are you happy with it? Are you satisfied with its features? I'm going to have Mark address this next topic. How many people are not using the default network that comes out of the box? And I saw a couple of hands. If you could maybe yell out what you're using in, in place. What was that? What was that in the back? The multi-tenant plugin. I saw a hand in front. NSX. Anybody using uh, Calico? Anybody using Contive? Anybody using Contive? Oh. Uh, is anybody using um, OVN? OK, that's interesting. So we have a number of substitute SDNs that uh, if, if you've found advantage in one of these other SDNs, you can swap out ours for one of a number of others that we, and we'll support the solution along with the partner. Um, Caligo is the latest one that just got added to our list. It's in sort of a quote unquote tech preview um, that we support that as well. But there's a number of reasons why you might choose one SDN over another, but the bulk of the time is because it has a feature you couldn't or didn't otherwise find available in our default SDN. So. Uh, specific to that last uh, bullet there, OVN, um, we have a number of features on our roadmap. They're going to take a significant amount of time to develop, um, but we happen to have a lot of people that are tied uh, and working closely with the OVN project. OVN is another OVS-based SDN. Um, so what we are investigating right now is um, a decision will probably be made soon, but we're looking very closely and looking at what, what do we gain if we rip out a significant portion of our SDN and replace it with OVN. A number of advantages right off the bat is uh, a number of features that would otherwise have taken us a really long time to develop. For example, end-to-end -end IPv IPv6. Um, you know, there's, and there's a non, you know, you know, full-blown multicast capabilities. There's a lot of things that are built into it by default. Um, it, it, potential, it has greater potential for removing double overlay performance issues when it's laid on top of OpenStack. There's a number of advantages that we would glean from something like OVN. And if you look at the number of uh, releases it's going to take us to build an OVN versus what it would have taken us over a longer period of time to build those into our existing product, there's probably a net advantage there, probably a significant net advantage. So we're uh, um, in the near term investigating these, the pros, cons, but longer term it's looking fairly promising that we're going to, to uh, integrate OVN. And we get, and there's other advantages beyond the feature matrix as well. There's also our Rev product and our OpenStack products are also moving towards OVN based SDN. So there's gonna be some cross platform uh, sharing of development and resources. There's also, um, uh, a number of, uh, um, what was I gonna say, just <laughs> lost my train of thought. Um, anyway, a lot of advantages uh, that, that are afforded by doing that, so we're going that route. Cool. All right, so that's a lot of involvement in workload diversity. Next one is persistence. Um, a lot of storage features into the product, right? And a lot of people wanting to really push it. We have finally gotten a proposal out in the Kubernetes um, upstream for snapshotting. How many people want their tenants to be able to snapshot their own PVs? Yeah. It's uh, definitely something that's been requested for quite some, for quite some time, and we're, we think it's going to land probably in the 3.7, 3.8 time frame. Um, the next one is stateful sets. Uh, the next step for stateful sets really is to tackle this PV issue. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah. And, uh, 
today, when you create a stateful set, you can specify volume. So you know, it's about tying data to applications so that you have a consistent set of data within a, with a, a bit of compute, a process that thinks it's the same entity that had that data before. Um, we're working to make it easier to use stateful sets spread across multiple zones or regions within a data center. If you have a cluster and you want to have multiple failure domains, we want to make it much, much easier. Really, and to be totally honest, as stateful sets have evolved, we knew we would have to do this. It was not one of the initial features, kind of a course set up so that you can occasionally get into scenarios where you create a PV um, and you don't have the perfect balancing. Um, the work that'll go on in the near term is to just make this work the way that you would expect. So if you spin up a very large stateful set, um, you can get volumes distributed across um, all the regions, um, at all the regions and zones that you've internally configured very accurately. Cool. How many people have tried, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, just to, to go back to the workload diversity. Yep. Uh, Amazon has GPU capability now where you can drop GPUs as easy as you add and take away Ethernet interfaces. Is there any discussion in terms of being able to recognize as, as maybe you know workload is going to increase, dynamically adding the GPUs to, to the node and then allowing your pods or, or any microservices to take advantage of that on the fly without us having to, to go in and, and, and make them aware? So I would think the hope would be that we do this through cluster auto scaling automatically. Um, but I think that's a good question. I, we haven't really talked about changing on demand. We've talked much more about getting to the kind of the broader cluster auto scaling so that you define a shape of nodes. And so when a new machine comes on that needs eight GPUs, we just spin up a new instance and make that easy. But I think we should, I, I can, I'll try to catch up with you later. Yeah, because I think timing for spinning up the uh, machines would be you know, a little more for us when we're some, as we talk about low latency and I want to be able to, to do that in seconds or, or, or milliseconds, then, then sliding in GPUs could be a lot faster. Yeah, I think this is, I, I'd like to discuss this a little bit more, so it's, it's a deep topic. Other question? Yeah, and then uh, in regards to kind of persistence and low latency, local storage. Is not on this deck, but it should be. I forgot to put that in there. I just thought about that while we were talking. Uh, so yeah, so there's work going on right now to add, um, we're trying to get the proposal in Kubernetes fleshed out so that machines can state how much storage they want to make available for local disk, and then um, the scheduler and the quota system will take that into account and allow you to use PVs that are local disk. So the same, apps don't have to change whether they're using something like EBS or whether uh, local disk. You can define low latency storage for, as a storage class and say, I want to have all of my machines that have SSDs offer up 200 gigabytes. If someone comes along and has a stateful set workload that wants 50 gigabytes per machine, the scheduler will take that into account and say this still has 50 gigs free. Go ahead, create a PV, bind that PV to that node, which then means you're tied to that node until, um, until that machine goes away. And if the machine does go away, we'll need the, the work to say the machine's gone, recreate the PV on a new disk. So You just made me a very happy person. Thank yeah. you. And, and it's, it's unfortunate, too, because um, one of please. the concerns we had early on in Kubernetes was about being too um, data locality driven and putting a bunch of complicating features in. Um, looking at the current design proposal, I think we're going to be able to get almost all of the locality stuff and still fit it into all the other work that's been done on dynamic provisioning and scheduling and late region awareness and all that. So I'm hopeful that this is going to be the thing that, um, that really lets people go do these low latency and makes it easier for developers, honestly. Because this is the most frustrating uh, thing as a local developer. I don't have access to EBS if I'm running an OC cluster up local cluster. Cool. The next uh, last one is security, right? It's inherent in all the features that we do. But in particular, there's features we have to deliver for security, and this is where a lot of work is taking place in 3.7 uh, through 3.8. Uh, the first one, how many people have heard of username spaces and, and want it? Yes? So this is the, um, the awful, I, I require you to run as root, and therefore 90% of your Docker images cannot work, right? Um, so it'd be great if that, it could start as a root user and map back to a different GID or UID in the kernel itself. Uh, we finally start to really uh, crack this nut. It's taken quite some time. Um, we think in the 3.6, we'll have a tech preview of a more controlled environment. Maybe you label some nodes and you send these user namespace uh, workloads to those particular nodes to segment them off from the cluster. Um, 
Did you want to say anything about user namespace? I think you know, there's kind of two parts of user namespace. There's the build use case, where people might want to build Docker images more safely, or you want to run certain workloads. And that's going to be our focus initially, just to make that be easy to configure out of the box, um, to not have to make any compromises to do that. I think we'd still recommend that even in that the next year or two, um, there's still a lot of benefits to actually going through, if you're very security conscious, about just don't run as root. And, um, There'll be, always be some trade-offs here. The, the goal over the next couple of releases is to get all of the support in the container runtimes to do mapping of you know, arbitrary user ranges back down to that underlying user. So that'll take, I think the kind of the step one is to make it possible to run classes of workloads that need to run as root safely, and then we'll add more flexibility over time. Cool. Secrets, a lot of questions on secrets. And I know of three main projects for secrets, and they're kind of land in, in this order. The first one is to encrypt at rest secrets in etcd. Uh, we still will encourage people to use file system encryption, but etcd itself will be fully capable of encrypting those at rest secrets. etcd is already isolated off. It's not associated with the network traffic that the rest of the workloads are, so it is a, a safe area. After we land that, and that'll probably be 3.6.1 timeframe, we'll just miss 3.6. We also have stabilizing APIs for vault integrations. So there's a number of vaults on the market in this area. What we need on the Kubernetes side are default APIs that allow us to integrate with any of the vaulting solutions. And that's uh, a project that we're championing in the upstream. How, how's that going? Um, so the vault integration, there's probably three or four different approaches. Um, there's the kind of, you can build it today, and there might be some trade-offs you'd make with security. So you can run something alongside your containers on a node, and no, uh, pods can start up and be enabled to go get that. We'd like to make that easier out of the box. Um, there's maybe a second level past that, which is container identity, making it easier to give uh, containers, an individual container, an, an identity that can be asserted by the rest of the cluster. So this container running at this time that it can then hand off to an external system. And there's a lot of integrations into existing systems that share this. You know, Kerberos effectively does this, right? Um, when you run processes on a machine, you give it a, a, a ticket, um, and that ticket is a time-limited thing that asserts that this process is who it says it is. We'd like to have integrations that enable more powerful things like Kerberos and those things along the road. And then the third part would be just kind of a automatic where all the secrets are stored off platform. And instead of there being any secrets in the platform, you can use one or more multiple vault solutions. Uh, that design work is kind of ongoing because I think we want to gather requirements from the first two phases. Yeah. And the, the last part of secrets that are really evolving is, you know, after now two years worth of secrets out there, we've come to realize that all secrets are not the same, right? They're, they're very specific. Some deal with infrastructure, some deal with applications, some are tenant-based, some are admin-based. They really need a typing interface, right? They need categories, and then I can start establishing different things. I can impose different things on categories. If you're an application secret, maybe I rotate you at a certain frequency that's different than the rest of the secrets. Um, lots of really cool stuff coming out of there. who has a cluster admin role to be able to view secrets uh, that belong to other projects, that, that belong to projects that they are not explicitly entitled to. Uh, simply having cluster admin should not be enough. Uh, is there anything going, going on in that area? So I think some of this is a terminology part on our side, which is we didn't, when we, when we created this, when we set up the cluster admin role, we didn't make it clear that cluster admin is literally root on your entire cluster. So we have a couple of other mechanisms, which is we'd like to actually get to the point where cluster admin is like logging into the machines on the master with root. And so you should never use cluster admin unless you also have a security model that wants you to log in and act as root on the cluster masters. Um, but we would like to, um, do two parts of that. Make it so that anyone who's an administrator in the cluster would have to have an elevated set of privileges to see all secrets straight out of the box. And that's, that's what that secret categorization uh, ACL subdivision is really about is, yes, the person who can log in to the masters or to etcd and has right access to that can still blow up the cluster. I think the, the vault integrations is where we would actually take the next step, which is there's really two attacks. It's, prevent people from accidentally treating cluster admin 
as if it's not the most powerful force in the entire known universe, right? Cluster admin is the Death Star. You know, there's really nobody who's gonna survive when someone gets cluster admin on your cluster. But give you that level below for secret subdivision as a cluster admin that works well. Use vault integration so that you don't even have to trust the cluster. And I think this is maybe a longer term thing, but enable people to build integrations where the secrets are stored off platform, the vault doesn't necessarily trust Kubernetes, and it doesn't necessarily trust OpenShift or the machines, and instead you can work out a process where, as an admin, you grant for a limited time this particular workload to access these secrets. And that's really, I think that's the ultimate defense to that challenge, is the secrets just shouldn't be under the control of the platform, and we think the vault integration will do that well. But uh, to the first question, yes, we would like to subdivide down on the cluster so that cluster admin is not, um, people administrating the cluster do not have access to all secrets. Any questions on secrets? Nice. Um, so scanning came to the product probably around the 3.3 timeframe with cloud forms scanning. The next step is to defaultly scan the registry, the internal registry. You'll see us doing that in around the 3.7 timeframe. Um, signing also comes to the product in 3.6, which is probably a, um, like a July, August timeframe. It leverages the PGP signing that you find in RHEL. The next step, now that we have these core features in the product, is to start introducing policies around them. You can imagine times where maybe you fail a scan, but since you are a super important application, I don't immediately take you down, right? Being able to, to give it some characteristics. Uh, so that's the, the next step with a lot of our admission controller. Um, and we've been working with, and we know that um, people want to use external registries that have rich features around this today. And so we've been working with um, a number of the, um, a number of our partners in the ecosystem to actually build those integrations and help make sure those integrations. And I think there's some actual talks at Summit around that. Um, I don't know if I can, I don't want to ruin anyone's secret talks, but um, the, the goal is to make it easy to integrate external registries that already have these capabilities and build in the platform. And it's also, I'm sorry, it's, all, it's also easy. Uh, uh, so we've made it easy to integrate third-party scanning tools as well, too. Yep. Hi, yeah. Um, my name is Ben Bennett. I'm OpenShift Networking Team Lead. I just wanted to put a plug in for network policy in the security category. So if you want to talk about it with me, it's upcoming. Come talk to me. Yeah. You want to give them some background on network policy and what's that, what that's about? Sure, right. sure. Um, actually, there is a, there's a, I'm, I'm also sitting on another panel, which is the security this afternoon, which I'll talk more about it. But just I'll give you the Reader's Digest version, which is uh, network policy is a new tech preview feature in 3.5 that um, you, for those of you that are familiar with the multi-tenant plugin, where you can go from the default OBS subnet to the multi-tenant, which isolates projects, or you can join specific projects, or make a project globally accessible. Um, the problem with the multi-tenant uh, plugin is, it, is it, it doesn't isolate uh, who can talk to who down to the pod level. It's at the project level. Um, also, it's by default bi-directional. There's a new uh, plugin called Network Policy that came from Kubernetes that um, allows you to isolate at the pod level and make it unidirectional instead of bi-directional by default. Um, and if you want it, also you can say, um, uh, and, and the way it does it is you just assign labels to pods or labels to entire namespaces and say, I'd like to allow anybody or just these pods from that namespace to be able to talk to my pod. And you can even qualify it down to a specific port. You can say just on port TCP 80 or TCP 443. So it's, it's a, again, it's a tech preview feature. I strongly recommend you check it out um, if, you're, if you're already using the multi-tenant plugin uh, because there's a good chance that uh, once we iron out some of the kinks that that might end up being the, uh, might be the default instead of multi-tenant, just because it can do multi-tenant, but better. Yes? Uh, currently, um, no. Yeah, it's two separate. There's really inbound and outbound. The model is such that the way that we did egress network policy was really to be that dual. So um, kind of this is like gets down to, well, how do you divide up your clusters? Do you have a single app, multiple apps, et cetera? Um, network policy is about ingress. Egress network policy is about egress. Um, the same controls and same patterns should be there. Now, we don't have label-based egress today. Is that correct, Ben? Sorry, you can do the egress firewall today, which gives you some decent capabilities, but that's set on a namespace. So it's harder to set as a user of the cluster. You can do it as an administrator. So that might be something you're interested in. Yeah, for anyone with egress network requirements, definitely talk to Ben and Mark. 
talked about that. Cool. I think that's the end of our time. I think there was one more question. Question? Yep. Any other questions, guys? Yeah, we've been working on a number of ways of making it easy um, for people to use existing geo-replication solutions like object storage. Um, so if you have an, a global object store, it should be easy for you to geo-replicate images and have multiple clusters use that. Um, there's a number of exploration areas for this and it, <coughs> excuse me, we also want to make it easier to get images um, from region to region if they're different clusters. Um, I, I think just come find us, we can talk more about that afterwards.